Hey, listen, um, God is God is doing so much. Uh, we, we just got out of a series. Uh, I ended it last week. I kind of didn't know when I was going to end it, but we ended it last week called A Healthy Heart. And I just so value the series, what God was doing through it, and um, just taking an introspective look at our heart. God, God, the Bible speaks of uh, out of the heart flow the issues of life. David prayed, search my heart, see if there's any wicked way in me. And I think all of you who have given your life to Jesus, who have made that commitment, can agree with me that just because you gave your life to Jesus, just because you surrendered to him as Lord, doesn't mean that you're perfect. (laughs) Doesn't mean that you have your life together. Doesn't mean that you still don't deal with stuff. It still doesn't mean that you don't have baggage that you deal with. And This series that we just got out of was about dealing with some of the stuff in our heart, whether it be rejection, whether it be shame, whether it be fear, whether it be offense, uh, whether it be having courage. God, I believe God was taking a look at our heart, and when we allow him into our heart to deal with our heart, he will do supernatural things. And when you can deal with some of the stuff in your heart, you can move into your purpose see your purpose more clearly, move into it faster. Um, God, you you become a vessel that God is dealing with. And this should be, as believers, uh, a part of our journey and a part of our life, always letting God work on us. If you've got it all together um, and you've arrived, then the news is you don't have it together (laughs) and you haven't arrived um, because we're all dealing with stuff and we've all got stuff that God needs to work on. Um, and I, and that's good news for me um, to know that, that there is no perfect Christians. And so I believe God has done some a lot of things through that. So this week we're going to start a new series and we're going to be a little bit back and forth. It's the summer and uh, so we're off to holiday um, this coming week and we're excited to, to, to be gone and um, but excited to come back to you. But we're, but Stephen, uh, Stephen Shoat, Stephen and Kelly are elders in Ansbach. He'll be preaching next week. And then our very own here in the Furt location, Mike Mullins, will be preaching on the 25th. So you guys better show up. Don't be out there playing in the sun. It's, they've got a word for you. It's going to be amazing. Um, so we're excited for that. But the series that I'm going to start today will be a little bit back and forth on is Path of Discipleship. Path of Discipleship. And discipleship is a word, uh, disciple, we see in Scripture. But discipleship, maybe for you, is a Christian word. Maybe you're not familiar with this word, or maybe you're very familiar with this word. Um, But the Bible tells us, Jesus commands us as believers to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But what that means is, is that you are a disciple. And as a disciple... When you've given your life to Jesus, when you've surrendered to him as a disciple, you are on a path, you are on a journey in following him in discipleship as we just spoke about of constantly growing and constantly maturing in him. And isn't that good to know that it's a journey, not a destination? Christianity and discipleship is not a destination to arrive at. It is a journey that we go on. It's a path that we walk down, and the Bible describes it as a narrow path. (laughs) The the Bible describes this journey. And we're going to go through this series as we look at what does discipleship look like in your life? What does it look like to be a disciple? Is that okay with you? So we're going to go to the book of Mark at the very beginning of the Gospels. And we're going to look at where The disciple where Jesus chose his first disciples, some of the first disciples, some of his first followers. And we're going to look at the first aspect today of discipleship. And I believe probably the most fundamental aspect of discipleship, if you're going to call yourself a disciple, if you're going to be a disciple, what you must do, what you must engage in. So if we can, I'm going to read a few verses today out of Mark, um, and I'm going to skip along, but I'll tell you where I'm at so that you can get an idea of what Jesus is trying to communicate and what Scripture is revealing to us today. So first we're going to land in Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 16. 
says, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he being Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. This was, you have to understand their profession. This isn't what they did for hobby. This isn't what they did for fun. They were by profession fishermen because their father before them probably their grandfather, their great-grandfather, were fishermen. This was a business passed down in the family. So they, did, they were doing what they knew to do and what brought in the income. What most of you do every week, you go about your week and you do the same thing, some of you, every day. You wake up, you get your kids out of, your, out of the house. For those of you with kids, you shower, um, brush your teeth, hopefully, and you make your way out the door, some of you to your workplace, some of you to the supermarket, some of you um, to around the house, and you have your what you do. You have this part of your life. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. I don't think there was ever the rule back then, stranger danger, because these guys just got up and followed Jesus. In fact, there's a reason for that. He wasn't quite a stranger. They would have known who he was. But they got up and they followed him. They left their nets, which resembles really leaving the very thing that made them income, the very thing that they knew that they were good at, left it behind and going on a little farther he jesus saw james the son of zebedee and john his brother who were in their boat mending the nets and immediately he called them and they left their father zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him so here you have four disciples who Jesus comes to and immediately says, follow me, and then, and then immediately they left their nets. Now in the next chapter, Mark chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him. I, don't, I, I noticed this in Mark when I was reading and I was preparing for this. Jesus found a lot of his disciples by the sea. And I just think I need some, I just need some ocean time. You know what I'm saying? Jesus found some disciples by the sea. And all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, who would be later known as Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now, the cultural component to this is that a tax collector, see, Levi, Matthew, was Jewish. He was an Israelite, and he was a tax collector collecting the tax from his fellow Jewish people. He was a traitor to his own people. He would have been a, the stain of the community. Jesus still, follow me. And he rose and he followed him, which he left a very wealthy life. See, the Jewish people would become tax collectors because it brought in the money. They, 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 were, they would have been willing to uh, sacrifice their, uh, their, their identity. They would have been willing to sacrifice who they were in the community and even their family to make the money they made. Lastly, I'm going to move to Mark chapter 8, verse 34. It says, In calling the crowd to him, with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It's a bold statement. Can we pray? Father God, we thank you for your word. I thank you that it doesn't return to you void. I thank you for these scriptures that we see that really are uh, a double-edged sword into our heart. And so that this would become your word a mirror and allowing us 
to see who we are, what we're called to do, that we would be challenged today. And God, you would grace us to do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm titling this message simply, Follow Me. Follow Me. Now, I'm, just, I'm going to reveal something to you that is pretty embarrassing, so don't judge me. I'm not good at many things. One of the things I'm not great at, in fact, I'm terrible at, is directions. So some of you even in this room probably have been telling me directions, and I'm nodding my head pretending like I know exactly what you're saying. I probably don't. I'm probably just going to get on Google Maps later, text you if I've forgotten, and say, just, just tell me your address. Just tell, just tell me what to Google. Can you just send me a link? And I'm going to plug it in, and I'm going to plug it into my Volkswagen Touron, to the Apple CarPlay, that nice big screen right there, so I can follow the directions to wherever I'm going. And it will not just take me one or two times using Google Maps to arrive somewhere to figure out where I'm going and eventually go, oh, I can get there by myself. Because I'm in dream world, I'm off to myself, and I'm just following blindly what Google Maps tells me. And what I love about it is, is most of the time, if it's caught up, it will move you around uh, d- uh, construction areas and different places. And it's smart like that, not like me. And I will follow blindly Google Maps to where I'm going. And this is the embarrassing part. In the hometown that I grew up in, I don't know what I did without Google Maps. I must have got lost plenty of times or just went in straight lines until I arrived to where I think I should have been. Um, And I would, when Google Maps or Apple Maps GPS came into play, I was one of the first customers. And I used it even in my hometown. Now, we're going back to visit, and I will use Google Maps in my hometown that I grew up in from a little kid because I'm just not confident in my direction skills. I can stand in this room that we're in right now. I cannot tell you which way is north, south, east, or west. I cannot do that. I am terrible with directions. I I don't even like driving somewhere with somebody following me because I don't even know where I'm going half the time. i rather, even if it's your first time, i rather follow you to where you're going. I love having someone or something, Siri, Google, whatever it may be, to follow. And I think in life, in general, if we're we're completely honest, uh, it's hard to navigate life. I I was just having a conversation the other day about parenting. Uh, We have three kids and a niece, and I was talking to another parent, and they tell you before you're a parent, they tell you uh, all these things that you're, they're, they're like, you just can't prepare for being a parent. You just can't prepare for it. And I'm like, yeah, sure, but I've got all these like parenting books and stuff, like parenting for dummies and all this stuff, like how to do that. Like this couldn't be that hard. I can follow a recipe. Um, I could follow Google Maps. Surely we could do this thing, you know? And what I quickly learned is there is, this is very true. There is nothing that can prepare you completely for parenthood. Every day you're navigating what to do in this situation. You're navigating what do I do when. Chat GPT can't even prepare you for parenting. Now, I know some of you, you've got a kid screaming and you're over there, what do I do with my kid screaming? Chat GPT is giving you parenting advice. But even then, even then, you cannot navigate parenting on your own. You need, you need some help. Nobody's perfect at it. A lot of you are better than me, but we're not perfect at it. And whether it be uh, the first time on your own, maybe some of you in another country Um, completely on your own, whether it be the first time in a relationship or in a new relationship or newly married, whatever it may be, I think we could probably all say navigating life is hard. (laughs) Navigating life is difficult. And not just navigating life, but when we come to Jesus, 
when we are a Christian and maybe you've gone to church your entire life or maybe this is your first time in church. It's not easy navigating the Christian life because whoever, if somebody told you that becoming a Christian was similar to pressing the easy button to life, they misled you <laughs> because navigating this is not easy. When you first become a believer, you might wonder what out of these books, which one do I read first? <laughs> what does that mean? The thou, what is that about? And you're like, well, what is the Old Testament? Because it really feels like God is angry all the time. And you're like, what is this about? And then you get to the book of Leviticus because maybe you thought you would start at the beginning and you work through Genesis, Exodus, and then you get to Leviticus and you're like, why are we killing doves and goats and things like that? What is this about? This is, this is I don't know. And nobody's helped you along the journey. Or you're like, the Bible talks about prayer, but how do I pray? Thank you, God, for this food. You know, I, what, what do we do with it? We need, as Christians, someone to follow. As a disciple, we have to answer the question. In fact, discipleship begins at the question, follow me. It begins at follow me. Because being a disciple begins with following Jesus. When you say yes to him, just like the disciples answered the call, they left everything to follow him. Just that moment is the same moment that when you surrender again, you won't be perfect, but you say yes to him. You are saying yes to following Jesus. When we when we give the opportunity to make the decision to follow Jesus every Sunday, because we do not want to miss that opportunity or for you to have that opportunity, what you're saying is, is I want to follow Jesus. I'm tired of following my old way. I'm tired of following my opinions. I'm going to follow Jesus because I need help navigating through life. But ultimately, it's about a surrender to him. What we have to understand is the word follow me in the Greek would have been um, a very significant word. This wasn't like your social media. This wasn't like, hey, just I'm, I'm, I'm going to the store, follow me, or hey, follow behind me. Uh, you, I've got the directions. This had uh, a very deep meaning because all of the rabbis during this time by the way, a rabbi was one of the most prestigious roles in the community that you could have, and all young Jewish boys would have esteemed to be a rabbi. And the rabbi then had the role of taking on students to train them up to become a rabbi just like them. And after going through training, after watching these young Jewish boys the rabbi would select a few of the candidates. And when he selected a, a, those few candidates, he would say to them, follow me. This wasn't unique to Jesus as a rabbi. This is what rabbis would say. It was almost like getting a acceptance letter in the mail from the most prestigious university that you had dreamed to be a part of. And what you were doing was is you were committing to follow the teachings of the rabbi. His teachings, a rabbi's teachings were called his yoke. That's what they would call it, which brings definition to when Jesus says take my yoke upon you it's easy it's light take my teaching upon you it begins with following Jesus now if a rabbi this will be significant in just a moment but if a rabbi didn't choose a student what he would say would be something like, go home and take your father's profession. Go take your father's profession. 
And so most likely, the disciples that were fishing, when Jesus came across them, had already been rejected, had already been said no to this career of achievement, and they were taking up their father's profession. Jesus was calling those who had already been rejected. Jesus was now calling them to his father's profession. Jesus was saying, okay, you were rejected. You're taking up your father's profession, what you know how to do. But I'm giving you the invitation of a lifetime to follow me. And if you do, I will make you a fisher of men. Your father's profession is a fisher of fish. My heavenly father's profession is a fisher of men. Do you want to join my family business? Jesus was calling them. Calling, and Jesus is calling you and me to follow him. This isn't just the call to the disciples that were in the boat, that was, were in the tax booth. This is a call to you and me to follow him. This is what it means to be a disciple. And what you need to know about this call is, is that he has said to you, given you the most prestigious invitation to follow him because he's accepted you. You're not rejected. You're accepted. He believes in you even when you don't believe in yourself. He has a bigger plan for you than you have for your own life when your plan is just fishing and collecting as many fish as possible he says i've called you to higher calling i'll make you fishers of men the boat and the tax booth that levi was in these places represent the constraints of our own purpose and our own calling they represent the place of our comfort but when jesus calls you he calls you out of the constraints of your own ability he calls you out of the constraints of your own possibility and what you can achieve by your own talents by your own gifting and your own knowledge He's calling you out of those constraints into a life of living in the impossible because he can do the impossible. He's calling you into a life of adventure. Listen to me. Answering the call to follow me is not an easy life. Christianity was never meant to be easy. But it's the greatest adventure you could ever join. It's the most prestigious calling you could ever take up is to say i will follow you he believes in you when i when i got to the privilege of sharing and leading my own son ezra to the lord when he was seven and i remember trying to explain to him here's a preacher right and trying to explain to my seven-year-old son what it means to follow Jesus. And maybe you've heard me say this before, but right there on the hilltop in Herzog and Naurach, I was sitting there with my son and I was explaining to him this decision that you're making, this is what it means. And at the moment, the simplest I could explain to him was this, Ezra, it means you're going to live for him, you're gonna love him, and you're gonna listen to him. For those of you with kids in the room, I think the listening one is the hardest. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to love him. And I'm going to listen to him. For the next few moments, let me just break some of this down and then we'll close today. Following Jesus requires losing your life to live for his. It's not a great selling point, is it? It requires losing your life to live for his. 
That's why he says, Jesus himself in Mark 8, 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. In other words, you're trying to scramble to make a life for yourself. You'll eventually lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. We'll save it. Does that mean you need to pack your bags and go to some remote part of the world to preach the gospel? By no means. But God has placed you actually exactly where you, he's meant for you to be so that you could preach the gospel, so that you could be a light into your area and world of influence. It's a mission field where you're at. There's many of people, there's many people who need Jesus right where you're at. But it requires us to lose our life for, this, for his sake. And what we get in return is the wonderful, most adventurous life of Jesus. Because we're following him. We're dying to ourselves. We're dying to our agenda. This is not an easy one, is it? I'm dying to my... Yeah, God, I know that you said that, but I kind of think this way is better. Like everybody did it that way and they were successful and you're telling me to do this. I, I think you're, you've got a lot on your plate, God. So I think I'm just going to do this. We're dying to that. And we're going to be willing and obedient to what he's saying. This is a constant struggle in life. Will you get it perfect? No, because you're not perfect. You're following the one who is perfect. I, I choose to follow him. The good thing is, is that when you lose your life, when you die to yourself, dead people don't get offended. So when I'm, when I'm getting offended, when I'm getting hurt, I ask myself, have I died to my own pride? Have I died to my own identity? Have I died to myself? Following Jesus requires losing your life. Discipleship is not a selfish pursuit by any means. Following Jesus means we stop trying to make a life for ourselves. We stop trying to make this life for ourselves. We take up his purpose his calling I'll make you fishers of men following Jesus as I told Ezra requires listening to Jesus listening to Jesus my mom would always say are you listening yes no 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 I know you hear me but are you listening yes no 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 you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth, but are you listening? There's a difference. I know you can hear me, but are you listening? Following Jesus requires us to listen to him. It requires us to live in an obedience to him, not just, okay, I heard that, but am I going to listen to that? I heard what you said to me, but am I going to listen to that or am I going to ignore it? Am I going to just tuck it away? It requires us to listen to him. And I want you to know today that following Jesus doesn't require perfection, but it requires obedience. This is so key. It does not require your perfection or for you to be good enough. It doesn't require you to be a good Christian. It doesn't, it doesn't require you to be fixed up, life together, and then say, okay, now Jesus, I've got my life together. I will follow you now. No, 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 no. This was never, this is this is this was what Jesus said to those people he said follow me one guy says well let me go bury my dad he says let the dead bury the dead and come follow me in other words he's saying you can't fix your life the reason you need to follow me is so i can fix your life 
so I can do a work in you. If you're waiting to be good enough, if you're waiting to be perfect, if you're waiting to get somewhere and arrive somewhere one day until you say yes to me, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. A guy by the name of Frederick Nietzsche said this. He says, the essential thing in heaven and earth is that there should be a long obedience in the same direction. There thereby results and has always resulted in the long run, something which has made life worth living. Long obedience in the same direction. Listen, God isn't looking for your perfection. He's just looking for your consistency obedience and you'll get it wrong but your consistent obedience long obedience in the same direction just look at the very one of the very men that we read about that Jesus said come follow me here's Matthew here's Levi in the tax booth a traitor to his own people to God's chosen people Collecting tax on behalf of the Romans. Not, get, not letting them buy. Not letting them not slack off. Collecting tax. Hated by the community. And Jesus says, come follow me. Because he's not waiting until you're out of your tax booth. He's not waiting until, you're, until you've got your life together. He's just looking for your yes. He's just looking for your obedience. I'll listen to him. Following Jesus means I I, I might be going where I didn't want to go. Can I tell you this? That in my pursuit of following Jesus, God has taken me places that I never thought I would go and that I initially didn't want to go. Whether it be location, whether it be, listen, I never wanted to preach. I never wanted to do this. I got terrified in front of people. And then he called me to preach. And then he graced me to do it, put a desire in me to do it, and now it's one of the most favorite things that I get to do. He might call you places you didn't want to go. Following Jesus means you need to listen to him. Following Jesus means loving him and loving those he loves. Following Jesus. You see, love is unconditional. This isn't about, oh, God did something for me, so yeah, sure, I will follow him because he does good things for me, because he blesses me. I choose to love him because he first loved me. I choose to love him unconditionally because he revealed to me what unconditional love is while I was still a sinner. Christ died for me. While I was still in the tax booth, he called me. It's unconditional. It also means that I live this life of loving the people that I naturally wouldn't love because he loves them. I love those that he loves. Following Jesus is about relationship. It's not about religion. It's love. He didn't die for you on the cross, raised three days later so he can establish a religion so that he could establish a club, so that he can establish an institution in which people come every Sunday and tithe and offer and sing and preach and have groups. He died so he could have a relationship with you. He died so he could, so that he could bring you into a relationship with him that was severed and broken. As I said before, the 
rabbi's teachings were called a yoke. And all these other rabbis in those days would have these, they would make up their own teachings based on scripture and their own rules to follow and their own ways to go about things. It was like, it was like the chef with their own ingredients, the secret ingredient. And the only way you can figure them out is if you, uh, if you follow them. But they became such a burden, such, such a heavy weight for these people to follow these teachings. They became so impossible to follow that it was impossible. There's no way to follow all these teachings. And that's why Jesus comes along and says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My teaching is easy. My burden is light. Following is different than being a fan. Worship team, you can come and we'll close. Following is different to being a fan. Fans watch. Fans cheer. Fans buy the merch. Followers sacrifice. Followers lay down their life for the cause. Followers engage at every level. Fans, fans are temporary. Some of you are big fans in the room of different sports, different teams. There's a difference between being a fan and a follower when it comes to Jesus. He isn't looking for cheerleaders. He's not, he's not looking for people to cheer him on. He's looking for people who would say, I love you. He designed you and me for love. He designed us for relationships. That was all broken in the garden. But in Christ, he reestablished what was broken so that we could have that relationship again and so that we could follow him into our purpose and into our calling. Maybe some of you are saying, if I follow him, if I go all in, where am I following him to? Where is he leading me? Well, I... I can't tell you specifically where he's going to take you. I can't tell you what that's going to mean for your life. But I can tell you this. It will be greater than where you would go. It will be have more impact than what you would choose. It will it will have so, be loaded with so much more purpose than what you would do in your own strength and your own calling trying to do it on your own rather than being lost like me without a GPS you've got a direction and a purpose when you say yes to him and you say I will follow you what you're doing is, is you're laying down all the other things this doesn't mean you need to quit your job you need to no this isn't what this is about this is about laying down your way and going his way it's about following him and pursuing him and God will lead you Jesus will lead you as a disciple into the greatest adventure of your lifetime he will he will he will take you places like any great adventure that are maybe uncomfortable, but He graces you for them. He guides you into His peace. He guides you into His love. He guides you into grace. And He's just looking for those who would say, I will follow you. Can you stand to your feet with me? Maybe, maybe today, maybe today the reason you're here or the reason you're watching is because 
you needed to hear loud and clear Jesus' acceptance, his love, his belief in you, and he and that he's coming to you and saying, follow me, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. I will take what you thought your purpose was and I'll make it have impact. I'll make it have potential. I'll make it have uh, such loaded with purpose and vision and you will get to see the impossible. Maybe, maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe some of you in the room or watching online have never accepted the invitation to follow Him, to live for Him, to love Him, and to listen. Maybe you were waiting until you were perfect. Maybe you were waiting until you had your life fixed up. Maybe some of you have walked away from him. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to say yes to him. To respond to the invitation that has echoed through the ages to follow him. Where the Bible says that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is Lord, we will be saved. What we're saying is, Jesus, we, you are our Lord, our master. We surrender and submit to you. So if you go right, we go right. If you go left, we go left. If you go straight, we go straight. If you stop and wait, we stop and wait. Because we're following you. We may not know the answers and we may not know why, but we're surrendering to you. That's what the decision to follow Jesus means. So in this room, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a prayer similar to the one I, I prayed by myself on my bedside when I, my way was done, when I was at a rock bottom and I had no other way to go and I was lost trying to navigate life on my own. I was so broken. And God told me, said, Daniel, you've put all this stuff before me. And I said, God, I, I want to live for you. I want to follow you. And I told him, I said, I don't know what that means, but I want to live for you. I want to follow. I'm tired of doing it my way. I want to lead you in a prayer similar to the one I prayed. And we can mark this moment together for those of you maybe coming back to him or making this decision for the first time. So pray with me, Jesus. Thank you that you love me. Even when I didn't love you. Thank you that you love me. In my imperfections. Today I choose to follow you. I surrender to your plan. And to your way. You are the Lord of my life. And I'm all in. I'm yours. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. With our eyes closed, if our steward team could just have available for a moment I, what we'd like to do is if you've made that decision for the first time you would certainly have questions like I did should I read the Bible now should I pray what does this mean what did I just decide what's going to change what's going to be different we'd love to give you first of all resource a Bible if you don't have a Bible and we'd love to somebody from our team, myself have a coffee and maybe just tell you our experience and what we've learned let you ask questions and so with our eyes eyes closed just so it's 
if, 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 if you could and you made that decision for the first time today, could you just lift a hand in the air and say, that's me? Or maybe I came to know him. And if you did, if that was you, even online, two ways you can let us know and we'll get you the resources. You can scan this wonderful QR code on the screen and fill that out. Just a way to let us know so we can get you the resources. We'd love to schedule a time with you as well to your comfort. And we'd love to guide you in that. Or if you don't want to fill this out, we'll have some cards down here at the table in the room that say today is my day making that decision. That's just you communicating to us that you made that decision. A decision between you and God, but we want to help you and just tell you our own story. Amen? Can I pray for you? And then we'll close today. Father God, I just thank you today that you are faithful and that you are good. We honor you today with our time and help us by your grace to follow you into your goodness into everywhere that you have for us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.